Madam Speaker, claims made by religion are misleading, manipulative, and coercive. And the fact that it's so coercive comes from their power to promise rewards and punishments in the afterlife. If another person forced you to do something via fraud and coercion, we think the state would not allow it. And that, in fact, in many instances, that person would probably be sent to prison. We think religions are no different and should not be treated differently. That's why we would have banned, obviously, promising rewards and punishment in the afterlife. We're, we don't think that this, that we're going to be debating the specifics of the model, but you know, we're going to do things like maybe possibly censor the Bible, we might have to f fine or even remove preachers who disobey and do not comply with this, we might even have to invade the Vatican and remove the Pope, though we hope to God we don't have to, right? <laughs> but the fact is, right, we are willing to go to all reasonable lengths to implement this policy. We, although we would caveat here, the punitive measures, i.e. punishments like prison time, jail time, or what have you, are probably going to be a last result. We're going to try everything else before we do that. Right? I'm going to give you three things in this speech. I'm going to talk to you about why there's a need to do this. I'm going to talk to you about how actually this policy makes religious belief a lot more meaningful, and in that way, good for people who continue to believe in religions. I'm going to talk to you for very quickly, uh, very briefly about effectiveness. Right? Let's talk about a need. Right? Four areas of analysis under this. First, I'm going to talk about why promises and rewards, promise of rewards and punishment in the afterlife is tantamount to lying. Because if I tell you something for which I have no evidence to believe in, we think Madam Speaker that is a lie, no matter how much you might uh, genuinely believe that what I am telling you is true, because I have no rational reasons to believe that it's true. And we think the state has to respond to it and make sure people aren't lied to, and more importantly, people don't organize their entire lives around lies and have no basis in reality, Madam Speaker. Second, we think that these, these promises of rewards and punishments are incredibly coercive. We think that the very fact that, you know, uh, the, the, these punishments are based on the, the, the threat of torture and the fires of hell, right, is, might not be torturing people's bodies, but we think that you're essentially torturing people's souls. And to the extent that people ascribe value to what their souls might, uh, what might happen to their souls after they die, we think that you, and certainly in many instances, might place more value on what happens to their souls after they die than their own lives currently, we think you are torturing them in the same way that you might torture many people's uh, many people physically, and we think that is incredibly uh, that, that is a massive affront to these people's agency. We say more more than to, to refer to people's agency, we think it also manipulates people's consent, right? Because we think that people's belief in the afterlife, the basis of people's belief in the afterlife, is fundamentally irrational. Because essentially, your beliefs are based on beliefs about something that you cannot see, you cannot touch, and you cannot smell. Basically, these are things that you, you that, 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 that it's essentially impossible to conceive of because it's so removed from your fundamental experience. And your fundamental experience is essentially what defines what you can rationally conceive of. So ultimately, when the church or when any other religion is telling you something about anything that might happen in the afterlife, they are tapping into your irrational sentiments and we think that is fundamentally, again, coercive, but also wrong, right? Finally, let's be clear. Many people don't consent into what religion they are entering into, right? Because many, very often, people are forced into the religions by their parents, by their families, by their communities, and there's no meaningful opt-out of that because their family and community would shun them if they tried to opt out of the religion. More importantly, what these religions do is it gives you a conception of the good life, a life that you have to strive for, a life that you have to, a, a conception of the good life that you have to organize your entire life around. Them. Right? So what this means is that people are forced to live their lives in a certain way by the threat of these, or by the threat of these punishments or the, the promise of rewards. And we think that it is abhorrent, and we think we live in the stranglehold of, of organizations like the church with this, because you know, they're no longer able to uh, impose such a great, uh, they're no longer able to coerce people in the same way when they can no longer make these promises about the afterlife. Fine. Judaism does not have a concept of heaven and heaven. Yet the ultra-Orthodox community coerces their people by telling them that their neshama, their soul or something, is getting weaker and weaker if they do things that are bad. Heaven and hell is not the only way to coerce. Don't you think you're making it worse by telling them and that we're going to stop you from doing whatever you want to do? So, one, maybe we can solve all forms of coercion by, the, by, by religions, right? That's not a reason not to do this. That's a reason to stop those forms of coercion, too. Two, I'm not convinced 
that that's a claim, not based on rewards and punishments in the afterlife. Because you know, what happens to my soul, because, my, because what I believe my soul is what happens, is what's left after I die, is probably a conception of the afterlife too. So I think that that claim would be bad under apology too, and you seem to agree that that's bad. So you've got, that, that, that's a crucial, that, that's a horrible concession on your side to make. Right? So second argument, right? More meaningful religious belief, right? So, yeah, so essentially, What's going to happen is, while we agree that we might be hamstring lots of religions in this way, or by this policy, we do think that there are going to be certain people who are still going to continue to believe in certain religions. Right? I think that's plausible, I think that's entirely reasonable. But more importantly, the people who will continue to believe in these religions are probably not going to believe it for reasons of rewards or punishments in the afterlife, but they believe it in a more genuine way, because they're no longer motivated extrinsically. Right? There's, no, there's no more external motivation for their reasons for belief, but actually any reason they might have comes internal to them, and in that way it's more genuine. But we say, moreover, any conceptions of what might happen to people in the afterlife, it now comes from people's own construction of what afterlife is, rather than a religious construction of afterlife. And in that way, it comes from people's agency, and therefore it's more genuine, and we think that's good. Right? A quick word on effectiveness. Right? We think this policy is going to be effective. And we think that the opposition needs to accept that to an extent this policy is going to be effective in order for their harms to accrue, right? If you don't accept that this policy is going to stop religion from teaching this, then I think that you hamstring yourself in that way. But we say secondly, we think that, you know, priests are largely self-interested too. They care about their position, they care about their power, and to the extent that we can threaten that via anything that we might have as part of our policy, we think that we can motivate them to stop teaching about the afterlife by the speaker. And we say, more importantly, this prevents the most pernicious manifestations of their attempts to solidify their power. Things like gay bashing and teaching about hatred of my minorities and immigrants, for example. Because a big part of the reason why they do this, they make inflammatory statements like that, because it attracts people and it strengthens their power and control over their communities. We think it's useful when we stop that. We think this policy allows us to do so. We're so proud of this bad proposition. Before that, um, 
point to our Bible, right? They tell us it's a lie and therefore it's bad because you're grounding it in something you cannot prove. That logic says we can't prove that we cannot teach that God exists. It doesn't say that we can't prove that we, we can't teach that that uh, what's called, that that uh, uh, heaven exists. And in fact, their only understanding for why it's a lie is because you can't give a rational explanation. So people have said that they've gone to the afterlife and come back. I've given you a rational explanation for why someone might believe that this is true. Therefore, by your own logic, I'm not lying to you when I'm saying this, right? Second of all, they tell us it shapes their lives and therefore we stop, right? Everything we teach in life shapes the way we live our lives, right? When you tell me that democracy is good, this shapes our life. When you tell me that homosexuality is not an abomination, it shapes my life, right? So what they have to go against with their logic, right, is any sort of statement of belief that might change the way people view their lives. We think that that's ridiculous and that they need to do a lot more to prove why that's legitimate. Finally, they tell us priests are going to do this because priests, priests care about their status. We completely agree that priests care about their status. We disagree that going to jail and becoming a martyr in the name of religion hurts their status. We think it's much more likely that if, you're, you know, if a priest is willing to say, I went to jail to pray for God and to continue God's work, this is going to raise his status. So by their own admission that priests care a lot about their status, getting fined, getting put in jail, is exactly what they want to do. So let's talk about that and let's talk about the coercion that's going to happen. First of all, we have to understand the power of religious leaders, right? Why they have power, not just within this version of heaven and hell, right? So first of all, most people still haven't like made that switch and therefore do believe in the concept of heaven and hell. And so what the what the priest says in this like when we switch this law, it, it's still going to be, even though even if they if, if they stop outright saying it, which we think is very unlikely, right? Just as I explained to you in my rebuttal. Let me just make that say right. My rebuttal said they're still going to to continue teaching it. It makes more sense for them to do that, right? So, second of all, we have a transitive property of trust, right? Like, I believe my parents, my parents believe the rabbi, and therefore it's likely that I'm going to believe my rabbi, because if I trust my parents and they trust him, like, transitive, right? So, therefore, it's likely that I'm going to believe my uh, 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 furthermore, we have weekly mass, weekly like Torah readings, weekly uh, 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 meetings with uh, uh, weekly meetings with the priest and confessions that you go to. Right? This is seen as a person with ethos, someone that we go to not just in religious areas of life, but in all areas of life. Right? We see people going to their rabbis, to their priests, about problems at home that have nothing to do with religion, just because they trust him, because of the standing up, not because of heaven or hell, right? But because he is the person who is bringing God's word forward. So even if he doesn't have the threat of punishment, he's still the closest thing that I have as a connection to God, whom I believe in, right? So what else do we have? Why is it so important for them to keep this religion going, right? Because of, first of all, cognitive distance, right? I change the way I live my life, and therefore, if I'm not eating bacon, which is fucking delicious, by the way, right? If I'm not eating bacon, then I probably have a good reason to do that, right? It probably is true that religion is so important, right? It's been my life's work. I've done so many things for this. And third of all, I'm trying to make God happy, right? All of these things are things that I think is A, my duty, my personal duty to do. B, the most important duty to do. I'll take second. When Martin Luther King arose, he basically Um, there are new Martin Luther Kings, right? We see that, like, in Orthodox Judaism, for instance, we have, uh, like, Mahon Hadar, who's working, who's bringing a new sect, right? We see that in Catholicism, we have more breakouts of different, sort of more liberal versions, and we don't think that this is, like, in any way engaging with our, with our point of this isn't going to work, right? So, uh, we have the fear of backlash from the government. Uh, we have the fear of backlash. For them, when we see that this most important thing is being challenged by the government, they cannot stand up for that, right? Because this is so important to them to continue going. So what do they do? First of all, they're okay with martyrdom and being punched. Second of all, they do worse things than teach heaven or hell, right? Excommunication, right? If you don't believe me that this is likely, know that this is exactly what happens with the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel, when they were trying to be forced to go to the army, and it was before they tried forcing them to go to the army, when they just said, this isn't a great idea, like, you should do that, it's, it's, it's not allowed. Afterwards, they excommunicated the people who went to the army, when the government did this, they, they made them into horrible, horrible human beings with cartoon drawings of the same that. They have the power
how to coerce outside of it. Heaven and hell is not the worst way they can coerce. They're going to continue using heaven or hell, but maybe more visceral, because they're afraid the government is going to change the people. This is what happens when we try and change religion by coercion. Thank you. We 
say on a comparative, eternity is worse than one human life. So the criteria we set was very clear. It is that this limits the agency of individuals. Because the choice of religion itself, when based with the threat of rewards or punishment in the afterlife, is not a free one. Because you never choose the religion you're born into. It is incredibly hard to opt out of them. Because of societal pressure, as Carlo tells you, but also because lots of religions give punishment for apostasy to begin with, which makes opt-outs even harder if you're unsure. The result being that religious forms are almost never questioned. And that is why people don't have the possibility to achieve themselves and to achieve their own agency and to live their lives in the way they want to, precisely because of this immense threat that comes from religion. We say that purely based on that criteria alone, it should be enough to, to enact this policy. But we'll take them at an even higher burden. Even if this is not a free choice, if it is still a benefit, we, we also claim that it is also not a beneficial one. What benefits could they claim to religion? What they could, they could claim that it provides, say, closure and meaning to people. We, we talk here that it also, we don't see why people should be forced into, say, irrational choices like not accepting blood transfusions when they need them just because their religion opposes them. Plus, they are often pushed into lives which are not closure in themselves. Secondly, they could claim that religions offer value systems. We have several replies to this. We have laws which are which already exist in the status quo. We have secular norms which are also incredibly powerful. We have norms for thousands of years, and lastly, we don't think that atheists are bastards. At least not most of them. Yes. You have to uh, like accept that I can whisper to my child at night that he is going to go to eternal damnation in a much more visceral sense than what I'm doing now. It's impossible to bend. If Jews were able to circumcise and cut the tip of their child's penis off while that was illegal, they can probably whisper to their child at night that they're going to hell. But you're not engaging with our case. Our case is that on the margins, on the comparative, you get less of it. You can see in both your speech and your POI that those things are bad. We don't see how they become worse. We're happy with circumcisions compared with, say, inflaming jihad or killing Rohingya Muslims in Burma. So, the last thing they could claim, the last thing they could claim is that religion provides a sense of community, that it makes people nice to each other. We tell that this will already exist even if you don't have such a big strength of religion. People feel a sense of loyalty to their immediate surroundings. They feel a sense of loyalty to their quality. That's why multi-religious states are also able to function. So, in the end, all benefits which religion has can be achieved through other means. But effectively, Madam Chair, when people are forced through subliminal advertising to buy products, when they are threatened, when people are sold into slavery, even if they like the slave life, we opt them out of that. The reason is because those choices were often not free to begin with. And for that reason, we're incredibly, incredibly proud to propose them. like 
like reason or any kind of evidence to say that heaven and hell exist. Yes, that is also a claim that is true about other claims that religions might make, like the existence of God, Madam Chair. And unless they're willing to stand up here and say they're going to ban religions from going around telling their beliefs, like um, their, their followers, that God exists, we think that they've got a bit of a problem with their principled justification, right? So we think that the, the, the idea of like this is essentially lying and fraud falls out of this debate. But second of all, the, the next justification that we get um, is that it's excessively coercive because we're talking about an outcome that is essentially torture. First thing to say on this is this is only engaging with the very most extreme characterization of what heaven and hell is, and we think that there are a number of religious people who can engage in the idea that you might be rewarded or punished in the afterlife in a way that does not involve fire and brimstone or a hundred virgins and chair. So we think that it's not actually as extreme as they say, especially when we're talking about a far off harm, which we say is quite different to the kinds of short term and immediate harms that the church can, can to let like you, such as excommunication, which I hear tells you about. We think that it's actually unclear how they manage to distinguish why this is particularly any different than the other. If what they then wanted to say was, well, we're going to ban things like excommunication as well, as I've already pointed out in my introduction, in order for religion to exist as an institution, you require some kind of mechanism that will either reward or punish people for adhering or not adhering to the rules of that religion, because religions in their essence are like a structure of rules about how you should live your life, right? So unless you're willing to completely alter religion in and of itself in such a way that you basically destroy it, which no is not what you cross color, maybe you should have, then, then we don't think that you're actually able to get away with your justification with this debate. Second point, effectiveness and deterrence. As Taylor points out to you in a point of information, it's very, very difficult for them to say on their side of the house that you're going to be able to like, get rid of heaven and hell in this concept altogether. They want to live in a magical fairyland where we could just erase this from religious belief. Why is that not the case? First of all, religion has a very long history. It's been existing for thousands of years, and it's going to be very difficult for you to censor the entirety of that history, even if you are willing to censor the Bible, Madam Chair. We think that religion operates as a community where word of mouth is incredibly powerful. So if I just 
effective and you manage to prevent people from saying these things, or even if your model isn't effective, it actually doesn't matter in terms of how the church will respond. Why is that? The church always responds in backlash when society and the, and the government and any other kind of actor tries to limit their behaviour because they can see that as an attack on their, their identity, right? Especially with increasing rates of atheism, low rates of involvement in religion in the modern world, the church feels always far, far more of a push to always make sure that they keep their members with them. So that means that regardless of the actual impacts of your model, the, the mere fact that you're actually implementing a policy that is limiting the freedom of that church means that they will respond to it in this way, which means that they will try and bring themselves closer together. They will use more things like excommunication and other tactics to try and prevent their members from moving away from them, and they will feel attacked by society. That is going to lead to that backlash. You can't just say, as well, that you're only going to change a very small part of the religion when you're open Those children from being rich, and yet we did it this 
belief in the afterlife. We tell you that people will kill for their group of white men or their group of straight men because the other is corrupting that group. We tell you that the promise of the afterlife is not only the best way to give people my identity, but it is the best way to stop these harms. I'm going to go into my positive matter and then go into rebuttal. Because I think most of my positive matter will clash incredibly directly. We think there's been a large portion of exactly what the world looked like that has been ignored by the government team. So let's talk about community extremism, because we've heard about religious extremism, but we've heard about authentic it comes from a lot of different places. We think that there will always be people who are willing to put that group identity and commit violence on behalf of that group identity over the individual. What does that mean? Whether that means I am willing to commit violence on behalf of my tribe, by committing my sect, my family, or even this idea that I'm a heteronormative male, or I'm a heterosexual male, I think the homosexuals are corrupting me, therefore I should go commit violence against these homosexuals. We tell you that extremists like this will always exist, regardless of what forms this group identity. But we tell you that these ideologies are incredibly difficult to discourage without the promise of the afterlife. Why is that? Well, we think people inherently enjoy their own conclusions and beliefs. Like, I probably think I'm the best speaker in the round, and so is everybody in this room. But we think that when they feel this way, then they're, they're willing to commit violence, because they think the group that I'm identified with, even if that group discourages violence, even if they say you shouldn't kill homosexuals, they say, my group is misled. One day they will realize the greatness of my action. One day they will realize the greatness of going out to kill those people that are corrupting my society. We think that makes it very difficult for groups to discourage these types of actions, because even if they say, we don't endorse violence, or we're not willing to say you should commit violence, we, we think that they will always, like there will be people who are willing to put that group identity, willing to be violent, and we see this time and time again. If you look to the beliefs in England, or even the Middle East, before Islam was introduced, before this idea of the afterlife was introduced, there was this group identity that they had to protect their group, they had to protect the person that they, they identified as. So why is the promise of the afterlife so important in discouraging these type of behaviors? Well, we think that if you cannot feel that God is not omniscient. You cannot feel that he is not omnipotent, which means that the promise of an omniscient God that will never forgive you of your violence, that will never forgive you of committing this violence against the other, means that you probably won't do that. We saw, yes, that religion has created this type of violence throughout the ages. We think absolutely they were responsible for the Crusades, and absolutely they were responsible for things like the Inquisition. But those stopped because they said, for those who say, to continue to perpetuate the Inquisition in Spain, you are going to hell. You are not going to receive this afterlife promise, which means that people, rather than saying, well, they're misled, I will continue to perpetrate violence, said, well, that is God speaking. I don't want to put my internal life on the line, and therefore I will stop. We tell you that is why the majority of religions currently are peaceful, because they can disperse violence in a way that no other group can. If you look to any other group, whether it be like white heteronormative males or like any other group, they're going to be more violent, more oppressive, more abusive. Yet when they can say the Bible says you should love all, you should be peaceful, you shouldn't be willing to negotiate with others, then they will stop that because their afterlife is on the line, too. Let's talk about religious identity and ecclesiastical integrity, because we think religions provide more than a place to worship. We think it provides people with identity, this idea of culture, and an ethical framework of how they identify who they are and what this life means. We think that's more important than any of the harms they articulate on that side of the, on that side of the house. Whether you're in Latin America or India, that brings communities together. Why is this belief so key? Well, one, we think it encourages actions that you wouldn't otherwise commit, right? Like helping out the poor, or giving 10% of my income to somebody who is disadvantaged, kind of sucks. But if I have the promise of the afterlife, I'm willing to do that. Two, we think it also validates the ethical framework, that they have some divine inspiration and that it is important to them. But three, and most importantly, you violate the integrity of the religion. Religions are all or nothing. You can't take the cheese of transubstantiation and reject the salami of afterlife. We think that you need to have this whole religion. You can't censor the Bible because that's how they identify as a human being. We're telling you that the majority of people are peaceful. Like 99.5% of religions that they provide this identity to are peaceful with the promise of the afterlife. We tell you it's not okay to take away their identity for this 0.5% of people that are being incredibly violent. We say that when you take away this promise of the afterlife, you take away that identity from every single one of them. Because you do not have the same kind of religious and ecclesiastical integrity. We'll take it. There are a number of collective identities which stop people from killing each other. The Czech Republic, Poland, and China are majority atheist countries. Why are they not in a Hobbesian state of nature or the New York Russia? One, let me tell you that like China, Poland, and the Czech have committed violence before, but secondarily, 
Well, I will tell you that we don't think that's necessarily true. We think that they still ascribe to, like Poland still the majority, the majority ascribe to some type of religious belief, even though they don't go and practice every single day. Let's get on to a little bit of the record level. We're telling you, uh, we're telling you that they say that they lie about things like the afterlife. First of all, we tell you there are philosophers who do provide logical proofs that the God exists and this afterlife literally you need to look it up. Secondarily, we tell you that people realize that there is no smoking gun. They realize that there is no hard evidence. They still consent to these religious schemes. Why? They, they also say that it tortures their souls. We tell you that the majority of people in this world are religious because the, the uncertainty of what happens in an afterlife actually tortures their soul. They are much more likely to feel Feel this torture, to feel this like uh, uh, feel feel this pain about the uncertainty, than when they ascribe to this religion. They also say that they manipulate consent. Again, please don't say we have God. He's coming next Sunday. Like they realize that, that like on some level that there is some irrationality. That this belief is based on faith. We tell you that's incredibly important. You hear the closing government that, uh, that this is not really central, that this is incredibly coerced. One, we don't think that the coercion of the state saying you can believe this or you cannot believe this is any better than the coercion that comes from these religions. But secondarily, we think this belief is central. The idea that you have to have faith in an afterlife is incredibly important. We tell you, sure, there are atheists who do not commit violence, and we don't say that's not true. But we say that people who choose to have their identity formed by faith, by irrational beliefs, should have that right. We are very proud to oppose.
debated. So, two main questions. First of all, what is going to be the reaction of the majority? We hear two general things. First of all, we hear that the extreme people are going to get even more extreme. Well, first of all, we never hear how many extreme people are there, and how extreme are they going to get, and how will this affect uh, everybody else. But what we do hear is that there is a very small amount of religious Jews in Israel that are going to be very upset if they get drafted. First of all, we're talking about up to 100 people, which is why the example is relevant. But even more so, what we're basically telling you, nobody, I know the numbers, but what we're basically telling you here on our side is that what we're saying is that these people are not happy. That if they have the, the, this, all, all this power today, it doesn't matter what we do. But we think that the majority of the people are going to get to have their question raised. Sadly, what the priest is saying is not the ultimate truth, and we think this is enough, and this is the idea of this was the dream. The second thing that we're basically telling you is that we, we, we hear is that people, people need hope. Why? Because they live under bad circumstances, and because this is an incentive for a better and moral life. Well, listen to this, what we're telling you on the second side of the government. We told you that this only ensures that these people never leave the poor cycle. Why? Because they have no incentive to make their life better. Because if they were promised that in the afterlife, God is going to reward them with so many things, and not like I said, 100 to 70 virgins, but I think most people would agree that it's good enough. Sorry, but I had to. But what we what we're basically telling you, if you have a reward enough, you have very little incentive. But even more so, what we told you on this part, and this is very important, we think there are a lot of political bodies making and religious bodies making usage of this fact. Why? Because they feel this is a way they can control these people. Because they have actual interest in having poor people in an endless cycle of being miserable. And they say, you're being miserable because you'll be rewarded reward in the afterlife. Being miserable today actually ensures you have a better afterlife, much like in Buddhism, and in some circle of Christianity today. We think that when we say this is, you cannot be sure, if you cannot be sure of anything, we need to make sure that people have the discourse, that they can never be sure, which means that they can say, oh, maybe I'm not getting afterlife, but I know that today I have my wife and children. These are the things that I want to invest in today. And we think that as a government, we'd much rather have people who think, hmm, I'd much rather pay taxes and work harder than just have hmm, the possibility of maybe being accepted into heaven. And we explain to you exactly what is going to remain of religion afterwards. We're telling you that it's going to all the pressure of the proven, like helping your parents, helping the, the elderly, and the rational reasoning for the things that you actually believe in. And we think, we think that we already see, like, the beginning of this today with the evangelical movement where we see more and more people trying to concentrate on today's life, talking about spiritual speeches, what we can do today. Yes, first. The parts of religion you're targeting are specifically the parts of religion that feel they need to coerce in order to make sure God's words are fulfilled. When you take and attack their means of coercion, that will be exactly the types of times where backlash continues, especially when it's so easy to break the law and not... Thank you. No. Why? Because we think that the reason you believe in God, first of all, is to make yourself life better now. Because you think that having faith in a divine entity is important enough today. Why? Because we've already shown you, and most people in this room agree that this is what you were born and molded into, which is why it's part of your identity. Believing in an afterlife is not the most important thing in the world today, but it's not even the belief in the afterlife. Listen to this, is the promise of getting into afterlife and do not need this promise in order to, to, to have a complete belief. But to my second question, will religion change? The only thing, and listen to this very carefully, the only thing that we hear in the side of opposition is that these people get more defensive and more extreme. No other way of explaining this better than that. there are always extreme people who cannot ensure that we will react, that, that, that they are going to change. But what we basically told you that first of all, they are the minority. Second of all, we're bringing the discourse up. And finally, they never explained us why this is so bad. Because maybe there will be some people doing that. But on the comparative, I think there are going to be so many more people that already that, that are not as influenced by religion, which is the majority. The, the people who don't attend Sunday school every day. The people uh, every every Sunday sorry. Not the people who go to to uh, to, to, to the uh, uh, to attend their their, their uh, classes, religion, something twice a week. We're just talking about the majority. The people say yes. I may be Catholic because I pay Catholic taxes, but I'm not sure if I agree with everything the Catholic Church stands for. And these are the people we're targeting. This is so important because this is bringing the idea of discourse. And in time of crisis, and in time of competition, religion will change because it is interested in keeping these people around more than standing upon the values that it thought it stood upon. For all of these reasons, I'm so very proud to propose.
shown, we believe that this is a personal point. So why personal people will still, the government has you believe that these people will still pursue religions without this concept of an afterlife. First of all, we think that people are intrinsically motivated to be better persons through religion, and it's not just, hey guys, you might get a mansion in the afterlife. We think that people do want moral progression, and this ethical code that my partner tells you about that is validated through these religious systems is that part of progression that they give. So we think finding this idea that religious belief is more meaningful to the government would have you say by getting rid of the afterlife, we think that isn't true, because the idea of the meaning is having social justice in the afterlife, that people can't get away with really cruddy things in the status quo, and then end up being completely validated because there is no afterlife. I'll take the top. So if you agree that we should ban lynchings because they're coercive, why can't we limit the coercive behavior of religions? No, I think we should ban lynchings because they kill people. I think the idea of an actual crime like thou shalt not kill, which hmm, is kind of a religious concept also, is something that is important. We're saying that when you start imposing on other individuals' identities by literally beheading them, that is illegal, and that's not something that we're defending. What we're defending is an individual saying that you can become, no thank you, a better individual in this life and in the next life, because you can access something more meaningful than the fact that you're just dying in a slump. We think this final point here, how do we discourage abuse of violent group identities? Are going to be extremists regardless of what they are. We think that they